John chapter 16, starting in verse one. And I know that I could read this verse to you. I could read this passage to you, but I wanna encourage you guys as, as I read, I want you to read this as if this scripture is for you. Does that make sense? I want you to be engaged in this as well. So as I read this, I want you in your own mind, in your own hearts to be reading it as well. These are the verse, the, the words of Jesus himself. And he says that I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think that he is offering a service to God. And they will do these things because they've not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, they may remember that I told them to you. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we just come to you thankful Lord, for your mercies. Thankful for your great love for us. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, Holy Spirit, for indwelling us, for working in our midst, Lord. We thank you that no matter how faithless we may be, you remain faithful. Lord, no matter how weak we may be, you remain strong in the source of our strength. And so this morning we ask, God, that as we go to your word, as we dig into what you said to your disciples, God, that we would be, Lord, that we would be challenged, that we would be touched. Holy Spirit, that you would show us the areas in our lives that need to change. We love you and we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you guys can have a seat this morning. I wanna welcome you to church. My name is David. I, I am one of the pastors here, especially I wanna welcome our church family online. Uh, it is good to be here this morning with you all. We're starting a new series today called The Dark Season of the Soul. I had to be careful there because I always just wanna say dark night. I've watched too many Batman movies. I kept doing that this week. Dark Season of the Soul. Uh, Pastor Travis uh, was in the conspiracy theory or conspiracy series last week, uh, last month, which was really good. But if you've been coming to church with us for a while, you know that we've been walking through the gospel of John. And so we are back. Uh, we will be back here for the next three months as we walk through John 16, John 17, and John 18. And so I hope that you will continue to be a part uh, of this series. It's been so good, hasn't it? Just simply walking through the gospel, hearing the words of Christ. And so today, as we picked up, I noticed something. Uh, I'm, I'm a person with a short, a short memory in some respects. And so I noticed that right in verse one, Jesus says that I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. He starts off this passage by saying, I've said all these things to you. And that should immediately for, for us Bible scholars out there, and I know you guys are students of the word, that should immediately bring a question to your mind, right? Said all what things? Because for every text that we read in scripture, there's a context that comes with it. And so I don't know about you, and you know what, I would just venture to say none of you ever did this, but I remember uh, being in school sometimes, and you'd be sitting there and, you know, You've got a lot on your mind, whether it's girls or whether it's, uh, you know, a baseball game coming up, or maybe you're just really, really tired and you're zoned out. And all of a sudden you realize the whole class is looking at you, including the teacher. Has anybody ever had that? It's just me who's had this moment. And, and, and you look up and you just say, um, uh, what did you say again? Can you repeat the question? because you have no idea what the question was. And the teacher, of course, says, were you listening to me? And of course, I say very convincingly, yeah? Okay, well then what did I say to you? What was it that I just said to you? Now at that point, you've got some decisions to make. You can either keep digging or you can just admit, I don't remember what you said to me. And so I'm not going to play teacher to you guys. I know you probably don't remember what Jesus had just told his disciples, but 
he had said all these things to you, when, I, when he says, I said all these things to you, he's referring back to really the last conversations that he's been having with his disciples. Starting in chapter 13, Jesus is kind of going through this um, monologue, dialogue. He's, he's talking to his disciples. And all the way through chapter 15, which is where we just were in uh, a couple months ago, and Jesus says that I said all these things to you. So what are some of those things that he said? He said... Uh, that I am the vine and you're the branches. You remember that in chapter 15? Abide in me. Jesus says that uh, we should stay connected to the Father each and every day, bear much fruit for the gospel. In chapter 15, he calls his disciples. He says, I no longer call you servants. I call you my friends. In chapter 15, he says that you have been chosen by me and appointed for a purpose. In chapter 15, and right before this, he says, probably most importantly, he tells them that he has been persecuted, and because they persecuted him, we should expect to be persecuted as well. And so Jesus is kind of leveraging this whole long conversation, all of the things that he has said to them in the past, in this moment, in order to fortify his disciples, to to harden them, to strengthen them, to toughen them up. Because he knows that things are about to get difficult for them. It's about to get hard. And here's what he says in verse 2. He says that I've said all these things to you, this is verse 1, to keep you from falling away. So that's his purpose. He does not want them to fall away. That's why he's said all this. Because they're going to put you out of the synagogues. And indeed the hour is coming when whoever kills you thinks that he is offering a service to God. And that brings us to our first point today. We just have three basic points today. It's a really simple message from these four sermons, or these these four verses. We have three basic points, and point number one is this, that following Jesus is not safe. So if you guys are taking notes out there, and I would highly encourage you to take notes, because just like we have trouble remembering, you know, what chapter 15 said, we're going to have trouble remembering what was talked about here on Sunday Uh, And so I want you to take notes. I want you to take them to your small groups. I want you to discuss those notes and be encouraged. But following Jesus is not safe, is what he is trying to tell his disciples. Now, deep down in each and every one of us, we have this aversion to danger. There might be some crazy people out there that love danger, but for most of us, We run away from hard and dangerous things, and we run towards safe and comfortable things. There's even like biologists call it a fight or flight syndrome, right? Have we heard that? It's in our very like makeup, the way that we're created to run away from danger and dangerous things and to to stay safe. And up to this point, Jesus had been with his disciples, keeping them safe. What they had been doing was dangerous. I mean, they're upending the, the, the um, religious order in, in Israel. They are challenging the powerful and the elite. But Jesus had always been there with his disciples. It was kind of like when you're a young child, you always feel safe when you're with your dad, right? You feel safe when he's got you. And so Jesus' disciples, always in the back of their mind, even though they're doing these dangerous things, they know that Jesus is there, right? I mean, they're going swimming in the Sea of Galilee. Well, they're not really worried about drowning. Jesus, is there. he can just walk on water, pluck them out. The craziest thing that they could think of, you know, no matter how south things get, they've seen him raise someone from the dead. That's like the ultimate safety blanket. And so Jesus has kept them safe, and now he's turning their attention to the fact that, hey, uh, danger is coming. Things are about to get difficult. But here's what I want you to remember, and you really need to focus in and stick with me on this point because I'm not very good at explaining it. I've tried a lot of different ways, but I'm going to try, okay? There is safety, Okay, real safety. And then there is the illusion of safety. There's safety and the illusion of safety. Are you with me so far? Okay, so Jesus is trying to 
help his disciples understand the difference between the two in many ways. I'm convinced in our culture, what we pursue most each and every day is the illusion of safety. That's a stable, steady job. That's a fully funded, you know, retirement account. That's our health. Uh, that, that is a, a paid off house. These are all things that we try to control and feel as though we are in control of this situation. We pursue those things. And I think Satan loves to get us to a place. I think it's maybe one of the biggest things that, that he tries to, to get us to do as Christians in America is just run towards comfort and safety. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, I don't want you to fall away just because of danger. He's saying, I send you into danger on purpose. Are you guys following me? He's saying that your goal in life and as his followers should not be to run toward comfort or safety, but to run wherever it is that he calls you to go. And there's a big difference between those two. You know, Jesus reminds us elsewhere in the Bible that we can gain the whole world, this illusion of safety, and walk in our very, very comfortable plush shoes into very real mortal danger when we can lose our whole soul. We can gain the world, comfort and safety. We can lose our soul, which is the real danger here. And so I've been trying to think about how to illustrate that, and I don't know that I can, but the, the thing that came to mind was we used to have missions conferences at our church growing up. Did anybody else have missions week or missions conferences? So our church supported missionaries around the world, and it was usually a Sunday through a Wednesday. Every night, a new missionary would come. They're on furlough from wherever it was in the world that they were, and, and they present to the church what it is that God is doing. And so we would sit there, and we would, we would hear these stories of what's happening in the jungles of South America. And we see these pictures of these families and these little you know, little kids in living in a hut surrounded by people who are naked and, you know, just tribal. And these missionaries would describe the work of learning the language and translating the gospel. They would describe the fact that there's no medicine and that there's people, the average lifespan was like 45 years old. And, and they would talk about that. And then the next missionary would get up the next night and he would show pictures of, of being up in, you know, the, the far north with Eskimos and, and literally like in an igloo with his arm around, you know, these Inuit people trying to share the gospel with these people. And I can tell you that there was nothing safe about what was going on there. But my heart burned within me to have that type of faith. There was something inside of me that said they understand what the gospel is. While we're here pursuing something comfortable, I don't know if either of you or any of you experienced that same burning of your heart, but I think it's simply because following Jesus is not meant to be safe or comfortable. And so if we find ourselves pursuing safety and comfort, odds are that we're not necessarily pursuing Jesus. And this is what he's trying to bring their attention back to. I heard it said this way one time, and it stuck with me, and it doesn't make it easy, <laughs> but I've heard it said that there is literally no safer place to be than squarely where God wants you. And from a world's perspective, we might admire these missionaries by saying, man, you put yourself in so much danger. And they might warn us, you don't put yourself in enough danger. And so Jesus says to his disciples that they'll put you out of the synagogues and the hour is coming whenever whoever kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. We have to decide which perspective we're going to live our lives from. From a world's perspective where comfort and safety is what matters or from God's perspective where our soul in eternity is what matters. And the second point for today, if you're taking notes, is, is simply this. It's that following Jesus is not casual. Now, I know that you guys will be shocked to hear this, 
okay? But I'm not that into fashion, all right? I don't know a lot of designer brands. Uh, I can tell you, no joke, my, pretty much my entire wardrobe as a high school kid was stuff that I bought at Goodwill on purpose because I thought that was great. So I literally don't know. Me, my wife, some friends of ours, we have a couple of rental properties here in the area, and every once in a while, people will leave some stuff at the rentals. And, and this happened not too long ago where I won't get into the whole craziness of the situation, but people left stuff. They weren't coming back to get it. And as I went through this rental and I picked up the stuff and looked at it, I saw something that even I recognized. I saw a purse with LV on it, right? Louis Vuitton. I knew that that, and so I got excited. And I brought this purse home to my wife, thinking that she would be very impressed with me. Now, Jara is not particularly, I mean, she, she knows the difference between some of this stuff. She doesn't have Louis Vuitton bags, but I handed her this bag, and I was pretty pumped. Here you go, babe. This is for you. I do this for you. And she looked at it, and she said, this is fake. I said, no, it's not. It has the LV. I, I know what I'm looking at. It said Louis Vuitton right on it. And she proceeded to point out, she's like, no, look at the stitching's all messed up. This is like not even real leather. There's no stamp on it. The zipper's made out of plastic. The, you know, the, the gold flakes are chipping off of it. Like, and I said, hold on a minute. Let me Google this. And so I started looking. It became pretty obvious that there, were, there are marks that mark a real from a fake. And those of you who know this, you know, you know, with a Louis Vuitton, there's marks that help you determine what's real and what's not. And so I said, okay, well, I mean, do you want it? She said, just throw it in the trash. <laughs> I think when it comes to following Jesus, we can claim whatever we want to claim, but there's marks to the real thing. And one of those marks is that following Jesus can't just be a casual thing in your life. In chapter 15, the Apostle John goes through some of these marks. In, in verses 1 through 5, he talks about how one of the marks of a believer is to bear fruit for the gospel. In verse 9, that you remain in Christ through all of life's struggles. That's a mark. Just remaining, not giving up, that's a mark. Verse 10, that, that you would keep God's commandments. Verses 11 and 12, that the love and joy of God would be in your life. Verse 27, that you would consistently testify about the gospel of Jesus in your life. There is nothing passive or casual about following Jesus. You're either following him or you're following the world. And there's marks to that. There's marks to the real world, the real thing. And here's what Jesus says, and this, this scares me a little bit, and it should scare all of us a little bit. He says in chapter 15, verse 6, that if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and he withers. The branches are gathered, they're thrown into the fire, and they're burned. Just like that Louis Vuitton purse, if it's not the real thing, Jesus just throws that away. Now, I know that we live in a world in which we get to define pretty much whatever we want to define. I mean, I can choose my own truth, right? Whatever works for you. I can choose my own job wherever I want to go. I can live wherever I want to live. I mean, we're in a world now where you can choose whatever gender that you want to be. But what Scripture says is that we don't get to define for ourselves what it means to be a follower of Jesus. There's nothing casual about it. And so these marks that we talk about are not something that you should be elbowing your spouse or your neighbor, or there shouldn't be somebody in your mind right now who you're thinking of, you know, that guy's probably not a real believer. These are things that should be introspective. Yeah. Philippians chapter 2, 
Verses 12 and 13, the Apostle Paul reminds us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Handle your walk with Christ with care. There's nothing about it that's going to be safe, and there's nothing about it that can be casual. Every day, your walk with Christ must be on the agenda. And then the last thing, our last point here, is simply this. And that's that following Jesus is not easy. They will put you out of the synagogues. And indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. And they're going to do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I've said these things to you so that when that hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. All too often, we make following Jesus sound too easy. Grace is free. The sacrifice of Christ, his exchange of his righteousness for my sin, that was free. The access that we have to God, he's here, he's waiting, he's just waiting, he's near, that's easy. But following him every day, through life's ups and downs, through the challenges that you face. There's nothing that's easy about that. And I want us to make sure that when we talk about following Christ, when we share the gospel, that we don't make it sound like something that it's not. Because this is Jesus talking to his disciples and he's saying, you're gonna be banished from the synagogues. You're gonna be killed. And not only are you gonna be killed, you're gonna be killed by people that think they're doing it for God. Things are going to be hard and confusing and it should cause you to chase after Christ diligently, daily, because following him cannot be and it won't be easy. And so when those moments come, when following Jesus isn't easy, what he calls us to do in verse 4 is to remember. Remember. I thought it would be good to just talk real briefly about what it means to be put out of the synagogue. Because when John writes that, we might just, you know, move past, oh, that means you got to change churches. But it's bigger than that culturally. The synagogue was the center of the cultural world in Jewish life. Your family was there, your cousins, your friends. This is where you did business. This is where you uh, met people. This is where uh, you, you, it was your only access to God, right? And so to be put out of a synagogue meant that you're going to lose that. You're going to lose your job. Nobody's going to do business with you. You're going to lose access to your family. Odds are you're going to be disowned. You could be tried as a heretic and killed as the disciples ended up being, some of them. All of this was a really, really big deal. And I want you to imagine, because of your stand for Christ, that you lose your job, that you lose your social position or your livelihood, that you're disowned by your family, you lose friendships or community. Does that sound easy? Following Jesus isn't easy. And that's when following Jesus gets hard, is when it starts to cost us something. And the craziest part of it all is this warped perspective that these people who are doing this are doing it from some righteous motivation, where things get so flipped on their head that they believe that when they cast the disciples out and when they put them to death, that they're honoring God in some way, right? I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. I hope that's where your mind is going. He literally did these things that Jesus predicts here. But what this passage says is that they're doing these things because they don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God, and they're blind. And they're seeing things incorrectly due to that spiritual blindness. But one of the things that Jesus does for us is he opens our eyes, and we see things differently. 
And we recognize that it's not my comfort that's paramount. It's not my safety. Jesus is worth all of those things, and so we must remember. That's what he says. He says, he's told us these things so that we remember. And so, here's what I want to ask you today. Was there a time when you recognized your need for Jesus? Do you remember that? Do you remember that feeling of conviction as you realize that your sin nailed him to the cross? Do you remember what it felt like, that feeling of utter helplessness to save yourself, to cry out, save me, Jesus, to go to the foot of the cross in humility, and admit that there is nothing within me that can save me. Jesus, I need you to save me. Do you remember that? And did he save you? Did he pick you up? Did he give you a new life? Were you born again? Has he been transforming your heart and your mind As you follow after him, has he given you a peace that surpasses all understanding and a joy in your heart that makes no sense? Do you remember that? Church, do you remember that you've been raised up with Christ? That you have an internal inheritance together with Jesus? And that when your eyes close here on this earth, whether it's today in a car accident or 50 years from now on a sick bed, when you take your last breath here and you open your eyes there, that God is going to appear before you as your Savior. That you're going to gather together before the throne of God, together with all of the saints who have come before and the angels and gather around his throne and sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Do you remember that that is what he has bought you? I've said these things to you so that when those hours come, you may remember that I told them to you. Don't fall away. Remember, when things are unsafe, When following Jesus takes you into wild and unsafe places, when you get uncomfortable, remember what he bought for you. When things get really, really hard and you start losing friends and it starts costing you something, remember what makes it worth it. Following Jesus won't be easy. It won't be casual and it won't be safe, but it's going to be worth it. Remember Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your words which convict. Lord, which challenge us. Which bring us hope. Which bring us back to the foot of the cross. God, each and every one of us, we struggle, myself included, Lord, to see safety from a world's perspective. Lord, to choose the easy path, to shy away from the cost. But God, I don't want to lose my soul as I pursue this world in comfort. Jesus, I pray that just like you asked your disciples to look back at all the things that you have said and to remember the words that we would as well. Lord, that we are chosen that we are appointed by you. God, that we have the hope that this world so desperately needs. I pray that we would live in that truth. And God, that it would draw us to worship you, to follow you relentlessly. And Jesus, we ask that you would draw near to us as we seek to draw near to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.